All right, so he's dealing with his lawyer. That's his problem. Uh, let's jump to this for you guys. Uh, so the, again, midterm exam is, will be available in my office for review during my office hours tomorrow. Please bring your student ID. Project three went out this week uh, on Tuesday, and that'll be due November uh, 13th, which is a Sunday. I'll announce on, on Piazza, but we'll have the Q&A session next Tuesday at 8 p.m. over Zoom. And again, the slides and the recording will be available afterwards. And then they've announced the final exam. It's Friday, December 16th at 1 p.m. Please do not book a flight uh, prior to this, um, right? This, this, this will be in person. Okay, yes? So the question is, does the final exam cover like overall everything or just the second half? It will be focused on the second half, but like, again, if you forget SQL and you can't do SQL, that's your problem. But would the length be a three hour exam or would it just be a bunch of encountering tasks? It'll be, it'll be like, it'll be like the midterm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That, yes. No, but like, just to like follow up on that, like, will we be asked like more say, obscure stuff from like the first half? Uh, I wouldn't call anything I'm doing in this class obscure, no. but. Uh, <laughs> No, it'll it'll be it'll be focused on the um, it'll be focused on the on the, the, the material we've covered since after the midterm, uh, including parallel actually, but including parallel execution. But like again, I'm not going to ask you like, you know, what's the join cost for this setup, right? It's when I say like it, it'll cover everything. Again, if you if you forget SQL, if you forget how a buffer manager works, you'll have problems. So don't do that. Yes. You're get, I don't know how other I don't know how other classes do it. it. It'll be a you know it'll be the same length and complexity of like the midterm. If you want to save the whole entire three hours, you go ahead and do it. Some people do. We'll get coffee and donuts and <laughs> review whatever whatever you want. <laughs> okay, he said no. Okay. <laughs> I don't. Yes. No, I don't get fired. No. I think. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh. Okay, I can't get fired, right? I have a, I have a child. I gotta pay, pay child support. Like, can't. That's what he's gotta deal with. Um, all right. So, again, we'll have more, more information. I'm just, I'm just saying, hey, this, we have a date, we have a time, we have a location. Please don't book a flight before this. Okay. All right. So, uh, at this point now in the semester, we've, we've reached the summit. We've reached the top, right? We started off, man, the, the disk manager, and we worked our way up to these different layers, and now we, you know, now we know how to take a SQL query. You know, uh, and, and convert it to a query plan, execute it, let it read some data, write some data at the disk, and so forth. Right? So, so now what we're going to talk about going forward for the next two or three weeks is sort of coming back down and looking at a bunch of other parts of, of the system now in the context of concurrency control and recovery. And the reason why we covered this after we've sort of gone through all the layers is that this concept of concurrency control and, and, and the, the protection mechanisms we would have for recovery and other things. These are going to be all uh, intertwined with all the different parts of the system. And so it's for, it just sort of makes it easier to go through all these things without worrying about these extra stuff we're talking about now. Because uh, now you understand the basic concept of like, you know, what a buffer pool manager does. So now we can say, okay, how do we make it uh, work in, you know, and make sure that the changes we write to disk are recoverable uh, or durable and how we make sure that transactions can run safely, uh, protect, protecting them, themselves from each other. Okay? All right. So. To get us motivated on talking about concurrency control, I want to come up with sort of two basic scenarios here, two really sort of obvious things, right? And so say we have an application that's recording some, you know, your, your financial status, your bank account, right? So let's say we have a case where we have two threads or two, two, two application uh, programs running at the same time, and they issue queries at the exact same time that want to update the same record in the same table, right? So how are we going to make sure that we avoid a race condition to not have you know, some weird torn rights or some uncorrupted database state. Let's say there's another scenario where we, uh, it's my bank account, I'm taking $100 out of my account and putting it to another account. But in between the time I take the $100 out of my account and before I put it in the other account, there's now a power failure, the, 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 you know, the, the building is struck by lightning or something, we, the machine loses power, uh, and this, the database system crashes. When we come back, what should be the correct state? Right, so the, the first example is what's called a loss update. Right, how are we going to deal with two threads trying, or two, I don't want to say threads, but two, two 
query is trying to write to the same thing at the same time. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a record. It can write to the same table at the same time, even the same database. We can have different levels of granularity. Uh, but we're going to protect the, the, the system is going to protect itself from these problems do, using concurrency control, which we'll talk about for the next uh, three or four classes. And then the second problem here of how do we make sure that we don't lose anything uh, when there's a failure, that's going to be in the context of recovery mechanisms, which we'll cover after concurrency control. And again, these things are inter intertwined, as we'll see as, throughout today. But I'm going to really focus on the, the loss update, the, the first problem uh, for the next two lectures, or three lectures. Okay. So it's sort of obvious why you need these things or why you want these protection mechanisms. Right? This is what the advantage you're going to get using a database management system over you trying to go, you know, go off the rails and write your own you know, data manager right, in, in your application. Right? Think of if you're a new startup, you're trying to get your, your, your application out the door and so people start using it, so you make money. You don't want your developers spending time writing all this concurrency control stuff and recovery mechanism stuff. Like, the, the fact that your application doesn't lose data when you crash is not a, a differentiating factor from your application versus your competitors. So why are you going to spend your time writing this stuff? You're going to let the database system do this for you. All right? And they're, they're obviously going to do a much better, better, better job than you possibly could. So the core concept that we're going to have to have these protection mechanisms, a reason about what does it mean for the system to execute correctly, is going to be in the context of this acronym called ACID. Quick show of hands, who here has heard ACID before? All right, actually, not bad. Good, excellent, good. So we'll go through each of these uh, one by one, and we'll see. Uh, it's actually more than previous years, so that's very good. Um, we'll go through the, you know, the ACID, what they all mean, and talk about how the system would implement the mechanism to protect them. But first, we need to find what a transaction is. So the transaction is going to be a, a, an execution of, a, of a one or more operations. Uh, in our case, there will be SQL queries. But we'll see out today, and it's going to be, from the, from the database system's perspective, it's going to see just read and write operations. But it's going to be these, these, these operations are going to execute to perform some higher level task or function in our application. So my example of like taking money out of my account and putting it into my bookie's account, right? The, those, the, the first step of taking the money out and then putting it into the other account, the, those two together are, are a transaction. Right? It's, it's the thing that the, uh, the application is trying to do that to achieve some state change in our database that it reflects some aspect of the real world or something that, that occurred in, in the real world. So the transaction is going to be a basic unit of change in our database system. And the key idea here is that we just, we're not going to be allowed to have partial transactions. So I can't do, if I want to do take money in my account, that's a write, take a and put the money in this account, that's another write. I, my transaction can't do only one of them. Right, I can't take the money out and then not update the other. Or I can't update the other without taking the money out. Right? We'll simply say, if, that, if I can't do all of them, then I, I'm going to do none of them. Now you say, oh, well, what about if I have a one operation, uh, you know, I mean, if it's doing one operation without, that's by itself, well, that's a one operation transaction. That's still a transaction. And there'll, there'll, there'll be some other interesting things that'll come out of that. Because uh, you, know, you can obviously have a single SQL query and a transaction by itself, but it can update multiple records. Right. So again, going back to my example here uh, of taking the money out of my account, putting my bookies account, the transaction we would define is is would be these three steps. Obviously, we do a lookup, a read into my bank account to see whether I have hundred dollars. Probably don't. Uh, and then we'll take, then we'll deduct the hundred dollars from my account, and then we'll add it to the bookies account. Then you can imagine other checks being done in here, like. You no, know, is my account closed or open? Is the bookie account like is it flagged for fraud or something like that? There's a, a bunch of extra stuff you actually would do here, uh, but you know, for our purposes, it's three steps. And so the, the the write operation, the deduction, and then the addition, these have to occur together, or none of this is going to occur. Okay. So let's look at a straw man system. How we could actually implement a, you know a database system to support this. And so. Let's say now we make a, a single-threaded uh, database system that's going to only execute uh, transactions one after another in serial order. So that means that like, if I have like, multiple applications try to submit a bunch of transaction requests at the same time, they're going to put into a single queue and be one thread popping those transactions off the queue, executing them one after another. right? And I mean, only one transaction will be running at a time. So now, when we pop up a new transaction off this queue and we start executing it, the first thing the database system is going to do is copy the database file to a new file. 
right? Just through the copy command, no, nothing special there. And then when the transaction starts running and makes, makes changes to, to the database, we're going to write all those changes to this new file. Then if we, if we are able to commit, the transaction says, I want to go ahead and commit, and there's no other, no other mistakes or failures, then we'll just flip a pointer somewhere that says, if you want the latest version of the database, it's this new file that we wrote to. Right? Would this work? Would this solve all? Well, he's shaking his head yes. Right? Would this, this avoid the uh, partial transaction problems? Can we assume override is atomic? The statement is, can we assume the override is atomic? Uh, override of what? Like the original thing. The pointer? Right, so again, so maybe I should draw a diagram. There's, there's a one file that says, here's the file name of the, the latest version. And then when my transaction starts, I copy the database like heap file and make a new one on disk, make all my changes there, commit, you know, flush those out the disk. Then when I go to commit the transaction, then I update that one pointer file to say, here's the new file location. So you can assume that updating that pointer file is it's atomic. He says he thinks it works. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Yes. You see, you're saying no, it's a bad idea. Why? Uh, a, like, it's the same thing as kind of crud on this because, like, it basically means zero concurrency. And if it means that for one transaction to occur, all the ones that went before it had to set up, completely run, flush their updates. And if any of them had anything go wrong, they had to have this very expensive process of, like, not only starting from scratch, copying everything, and just doing lots of files, and had to, like, either do a lots of updates at the end or once at the end. All the updates kind of get mangled in, but wait, why would they get mangled in? Well, you have all these dirty copies. What if partway through the process of updating, to replace things between all the dirty ones, what if halfway in that that gets interrupted and starts running again? Hey, just delete the file. Who cares? That's easy. Yes. So, but in principle, OS can do something like shadow processing, where, like, even though you said you want to modify this fifty gigabyte file, maybe only one kilobyte, like, it will do the exact same pointer thing, and then it wouldn't like. You're describing MMAP. Uh, <laughs> that's going to have problems with that. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, there's no concurrency because you do everything sequentially. Yes. And then every time we actually make the transaction, we have to copy the entire database file to create an efficient. Yeah. So he's basically said there's there's no concurrency because the transactions are executing in serial order, one after another, and then every time you want to start a new transaction, you got to copy this entire file. If it's a four kilobyte page file, sorry, the, the, the database is only four kilobytes. Who cares? If it's if it's four petabytes then yeah, you care. So this, so there's sort of two ways to think about this. Is it correct and is it fast? This is correct. If you do this, you can guarantee that your transactions will execute in, in, in a correct order and produce a correct database state. And I'll, I'll define what correctness is in a second. But as you guys pointed out, it's, it's going to be slow. Uh, now, if you think about the problem you had with checkpoint two, you had to rate a concurrent B plus tree, right? If you make it single threaded, you don't have to do any of that, right? And there are some systems like Redis and BoltDB that actually do that. Uh, but in general, we're gonna, most systems are going to have uh, concurrent threads and concurrent transactions, so you do need that, that concurrency control. Yes? But isn't Redis known to be quite fast? So what's the, I don't quite get it. Your statement, statement is, is Redis known to be quite fast? Why? Is what you asking? Because yeah, it's, 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 single, single it's single threaded and in memory. Right? So like, if your database fits entirely in memory, fantastic, great. If you can execute all the, the operations you need to do with a single thread, then yeah, great. Yes? But why can't we execute the thread from all the time to say that? Yeah, so his statement is, and we're getting this, like, why can't we just do this instead of copying the entire database file, what if we copy pages? Yeah, That's shadow paging. We'll get that in a second, yeah. OK, so this will work, but it's going to be slow. Uh, and in a modern system, uh, we're actually going to want to have concurrent transactions. Right? Because just like we had when we talked about parallel execution, we want to take better advantage of the hardware that we have, allow multiple threads run at the same time. Um, and in any case, we have a transaction that tries to read something that's not in memory, right? There's a miss in our, in our buffer pool, and we got to go out to disk and get it. Well, we can let that transaction uh, wait and stall while, while it goes, the system goes fetches that disk, or that fetches the pages from disk. But then we can let other transactions keep running, right? So essentially what we're trying to do here is interleave our transactions to get better parallelism, better concurrency in, in, our, in our database system. But we want to do it in a way that guarantees that, that the database is going to be correct. Now again, I'll define what correctness is. And obviously, in some cases, we're going to care about fairness. 
right? We don't want transactions to get starved, uh, you know, because they keep getting preempted by some other transaction. So the challenge we're going to face is that when we start interleaving these operations in our transactions, it's going to put the database in, in a inconsistent or invalid state, right? So my example of taking money out of my account, putting it to my bookies account. Right? There'll be a moment where I'll take the money out of my account, and at that point in time, that money doesn't exist anywhere because I haven't put it in, you know, updated the other, the, the other account with the, the new, new value. Right? So that's unavoidable. Right? Think of the low-level execution of, of the system. Right? There's no magic you know, instruction that we can go update two different pages atomically at exactly the same time. Right? So these temporary inconsistencies are going to be unavoidable, but it's okay because we're not going to expose that inconsistent state to the outside world. Again, I'll explain what all this is and it means in a second. What we want to avoid is the uh, permanent inconsistency, meaning like if I take the money in my account, the system crashes, and I don't put the money back in my account, now the, you know, the bank has magically lost $100, and that would be bad. So these, these are the protection mechanism we're going to need to uh, have to make sure that everything is, is going okay. So to define what it means to be uh, correct, we need to define actually what a database is. And this will be a simplifying instruction or sim sim simplification of how a real database works that we'll go through uh, for this class because I'll make it easier to understand these concepts as we go along. And then on Tuesday next week when we talk about two-phase locking, we'll talk about how to do this in the context of a real system. So the, the, the transaction is going to be able to carry out as many operations at once on the data on the database, uh, and it can, can read and write whatever, whatever it wants. I'm not going to define what actually is a, a, an object in the database. Uh, we'll just call it, you know, use, use variables like A, B, C, D. Uh, in practice, it's usually going to be a tuple, but you could apply these same techniques for, for, for pages, for tables, for, for, for databases. And the other thing, important thing to understand is that we can only... Uh, the database will only be able to control things that are within its purview, uh, or meaning of the data that is actually being stored inside the database. So that means if, if the application does something that leaves the orbit of the database system, we have no control over that, and therefore we can't, we can't reverse that or roll things back. Meaning like, if I, uh, if I take the money out of my account, put it in my bookies account, and then the application sends an email confirmation to say, hey, Andy, you know, we, we, did, we did the transfer, but then the transaction aborts and rolls back that change, the data system can't magically retract that email, right? So there are, there are external things that the tr application may do in the context of a, of a transaction, but because the data system is not the one doing it, it has no control. All right, so we're gonna find a database for this class to be a fixed set of named objects. As I said, just A, B, C, D. Uh, we don't need to define what those objects are now. All the techniques we'll talk about today, and actually for pretty much all the techniques we'll talk about going forward, it, it, it doesn't matter what the granularity is. Um, and the other key thing to point out is that I'm saying the database is fixed, meaning we're not going to support inserts and deletes. Uh, we can only do reads and writes on database objects that already exist. Again, we'll, we'll see how we handle that, uh, how we insert and deletes uh, next class. And then for our transaction, we're just going to say it's a sequence of uh, read and write operations read A, write B, and so forth, right? We don't see, for our purposes here, we're not going to actually see SQL queries. So, so in this case, write is like an update, right? Yes, in this statement, write is an update, yes. Write is a replace rather than a append, right? Again, yeah, like think, think of, it's, over, it's overwriting whatever the value was there before, right? Say B equals Andy, I overwrite it with B equal, equals uh, Charlie. All right, so in SQL, again, we won't talk too much about this, but uh, you'll see it in the schedules that I show. Uh, you start a new transaction every time you call begin. Uh, there is something called auto commit, where basically anytime I have a SQL query, it assumes that's the, the start and stop of, of a new transaction. Um, but in general, you explicitly start the transaction in SQL using begin. And then you can either uh, complete the transaction with either a commit or an abort. Commit says, I want to save all the changes I've made. Abort says roll back everything. I think the SQL standard also supports the rollback. Uh, instead of abort, you can say rollback. Uh, I think Postgres supports both abort and rollback. My SQL only supports one. I can't keep track, but like, I'll just use abort because it's, it's there's fewer characters, fewer letters. 
Um, right, so if I abort, then it's going to be as if the database never executed the transaction at all. Now, one important thing to understand also, too, is that if the applicant says calls, a, calls commit, there's no guarantee the database system is actually going to commit your transaction. Right? Just because you want to commit doesn't mean it's going to let you. So it may be the case that you call commit, the database says, aha, no, you did something you're not allowed to do, and you actually get an abort, and you get, the, you get an exception thrown, thrown back at you that says we can't commit this transaction, and it gives you, uh, usually t might tell you why, uh, and there are partial rollbacks, which we can talk about uh, later, but in general, you have to write your application to, 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 to when you call commit, handle the exception that says I wasn't allowed to, right? And the aborts could either be because you call abort, or like I said, if the data system is you can't proceed and it kills you. Yes? Why would the database stay on the commit step and not on the early, uh, early queries? His, statement, his question is, why would the data system fail on the commit step and not on the early queries? Because you could do what's called optimistic currency control, where you assume everything's OK. You let it do whatever, the transaction do whatever it wants. And then only on commit, you go then verify. All right, so we we sounded like everyone heard of ASIN before, but I was, so I'll go through this quickly, and then we'll go through more details how, how this is actually implemented. All right, so ASIN stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So the first one, atomicity, basically it's the, the partial transaction thing, right? All the actions or operations or transactions have to occur, or none of them happen, right? Consistency, this one's a bit vague, uh, and we'll see why when we discuss it. It'll make more sense when we talk about distributed bases. Um, but it basically says if the transaction is consistent and the database starts off being consistent, then when I execute the transaction, it has to be consistent. Right? That, that's, pretty, that's, that's pretty confusing. It basically means that like, if the database was correct and the transaction does correct things, then my database will be correct after I execute the transaction. So now you're saying, well, what does it mean to be correct? It depends. So the true story is like the supposedly the guy that invented this term acid, he kind of admitted he shoehorned C in there to get to make it be acid, because he was trying to make it fun of his wife or something. That's it's some I don't know if it's an urban myth or whatever, but like his wife didn't like sweets, so he called her an acid woman. So he named this after her. Um, he was German, so I, huh? He's German, so I, who knows? All right. Isolation could be the, we want to give the illusion that our transactions are executing in serial order, like one after another, even though, even though they're not really. And then durability means that if the, the transaction commits and we get the notification by the outside world that it commits, then no matter if the database system catches on fire or blows up or crashes, then we should be able to see our changes afterwards. Now, someone might come and overwrite those changes. We, we obviously have to support that. But assuming that's not the case, then our changes should, should be durable. All right, so we're going to go through these uh, one by one. Again, so today's class is the high-level concepts and understanding what this all means and how we'd actually potentially implement it. And then and we're not going to go into actually specific algorithms and actually implement this. We will cover that uh, starting next week. I just want to understand, make sure you guys understand what, what the, what's actually going on, uh, why these things matter, and what are the sort of correctness guarantees we need, we need to be... Uh, we need, we need to provide. We're going to mostly focus on isolation because that's the, that's the trickiest one here. All right, so as we already said, atomicity, again, it's no partial transactions. We're basically guaranteeing that all the, the, all the operations that are, in a that are in a transaction will happen atomically all at once. Right? And again, it doesn't mean that you, it's gonna, you can't execute these truly atomically in some point in time, but from the outside world, it, it'll appear that's the case. right? So that if we, we go and commit, then all our changes get applied. If we abort, then everything gets rolled back. So these are the two examples uh, that we talked about before. Um, well, the, the, the taking the money out of my account and putting my bookies account. But it's two different scenarios of this. So if we take $100 out of my account, but then the data system aborts our transaction before we apply it to the other account, we need to make sure we roll that, that one back. And then if we take the $100 out of my account, but then there's a, cr a crash and a failure, Again, it's basically the same thing. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen. So the correct state of the database in both of these scenarios will be as if my transaction didn't execute at all. And the database system is going to use concurrent control protocol and, it's, uh, and the, the recovery scheme to ensure that this, this is the case. So there's two basic ways to support this. Uh, the first is through logging, uh, sometimes called, okay, also called the write-ahead log or that log structure stuff that we talked about before, where 
as the transactions are making changes to the database, we're going to write these log records that keep, keep track of the change that was being made. Uh, and it'll have information of how to undo that change if necessary. So now if there's a crash, then I can go back and look at my log and say, okay, what was I doing at the time of a crash before this thing got committed and potentially reverse those changes. In the case of the log structured uh, storage that we talked about before, uh, there really isn't that any recovery you potentially have to do because the log itself tells you exactly what happened. So most systems are, are, are traditionally most systems would, would maintain a log separate from the database heap files. If you're using log structured storage, you don't need to, the log itself is everything you need to, to provide this. Beyond just for durability reasons, logs are used in, in, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, it'll, it guarantees that you, you can have much sequential writes instead of random writes. Um, and it oftentimes too in uh, like enterprise systems, you need the log for auditing. Uh, there's like, you know, regulatory reasons you need to keep track of, I think in the US, the last seven years of any financial transaction. So that's essentially the write-ahead log. You could use that to figure out what actually happened. All right. The other approach is what he brought up, uh, and it's called shadow paging. And it's basically this, the same example that I talked about at the beginning, the straw man, where instead of actually copying the entire file, you'll copy the pages that the transaction modifies. Uh, keep track of some, there's some data structure, keep track of what those dirty pages are. And then when you commit, you just flip a pointer to say, okay, here's the latest version of that, that directory data structure with all my new updated pages, right? So this technique is rare. The logging one is the most common. Uh, but this is actually what they implemented in the first relational database system at, at IBM, right, in system R. But they ended up abandoning it because uh, it would suffer from, from, from a lot of fragmentation uh, because now you're, you, you, you know, if, if you do, like, you would sort of invalidate pages because uh, they, they would get... They, they, they would get updated by a transaction. You have to update new pages. And then you just sort of had this, this hodgepodge of, uh, of, of pages of what was the latest version of, of the database at a, at a given time. Um, and you had fragmentation. You had to do garbage collection. It was, it was very expensive. Um, and it was, it was a lot of random reads. Whereas if you use the write-ahead log from the, the last slide, you get sequential access, and that's better. Um, so they abandoned this, and then they... When they built DB2 in the 1980s, they switched over to the, the, the logging approach. The three systems, the modern systems that actually that I know that do do something like this is CouchDB, Tokyo Cabinet, and LMDB. LMDB is a embedded in memory uh, B plus tree or index organized uh, database uh, that uses MMAP. And this guy is very, very, how do I say this? He is very, very opinionated about how great MMAP is. Uh, and he emails me about this. Uh, he's wrong. Okay. <laughs> CalCB uses something similar, and the Tokyo cabinet was a uh, embedded uh, key value store that was sort of popular out of Japan a few years ago. I don't think a lot of people are still using it anymore. But again, this is rare. Um, so the advantage of this approach, like, you know, why would you actually anybody want to do this, is that you actually get instantaneous recovery. Uh, in the right ahead log approach, when you crash, you gotta, it's like the black box of, the, of an airplane. If the plane crashes, you got to look in the black box and figure out what actually happened. Same thing with the database. When it crashes, you got to look, the system has to look in the right ahead log to figure out what was going on at the time of the crash and put the database back to a correct state to remove any partial transactions. In shadow paging, uh, when you crash and come back, you don't do anything because that pointer is always going to point, uh, the directory is always going to point to the latest version of the database. Any transaction that was running at the time of the crash, they were updating a bunch of, uh, you know, the, like secondary copy, the shadow copy. So you just ignore that and, and garbage collect that when you come back up, right? So, you know, it's not to say that this is uh, a terrible idea. It does have particular advantages, um, but most systems choose the right-ahead log approach, the logging approach, because of uh, performance reasons. Yes? Hey, what happens if the crash is during the updating of the pointers? Question is, what happens if there's a crash is updating of the pointers? Uh, you assume that has to be atomic. Like, that has to be atomic. But it's updating a pointer. Like, you, you can do that atomically. Um, the one system that, that, that is interesting that did do this as well, uh, I don't know the name of it. It was the 1970s. Um, it was this database built by, like, the Puerto Rican uh, telephone company. Um, and it's, Puerto Rico has problems now. But in the 1970s, they had even more problems with the power. The power was always going on randomly. So they built a database system using shadow paging because... When the power went off randomly, the system would crash. 
And because it happened so many times within the day, when the power came back on, you would have instantaneous recovery if you used shadow paging. Yes? Does this allow for concurrent access to certain pages? This question is, does this allow for concurrent access to certain pages? You would have to use like the isolation mechanisms to, to above that to protect it. Yes, but you could. Back in the day, though, it was like it was a unit processor. It had one core. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So if you're using Azure, you no longer have to make the copy of the entire database. Your question is, and she's correct, if you're using shadow paging, you don't make a copy of the entire database, as I said before. You make copy of individual pages. Yes. But there's additional data structure to say, here's the pages I've copied. Yes. So which makes more sense for in-memory databases? This question, what makes more sense for in-memory databases? Uh, I think Red Hat logging is still better. The logging is still better. Okay. We, we, we can cover that later. Yes? But how would a memory database be handled? Because I thought you just lost it. Well, let's take that offline. You have a log. You log the disk. Oh. Yeah. OK. All right, so let's talk about consistency. Um, Again, th this one is kind of kind of vague, and it's, so bear with me here. Um, so the thing I understand is like, what the database is trying to do. The database is trying to model something in the real world, right? And and so you think of like I have a database on S3 of what students take what classes, right? You're all here, students. You're enrolled in this class. So somewhere there's a, there's a record that says student X is enrolled in 15445645, right? And then if you're enrolled in the class, you obviously want to row there. If you drop the class, then that, that gets marked as dropped and so forth, right? So we want our, our, the database represent whatever the thing in, in the real world to be like logically correct. So that when you ask questions about it, like is this student enrolled in this class, and, and the person is truly enrolled in the class, it comes back with yes, true, right? So that's what, that's what I sort of mean by, by consistency. And there's sort of two levels of this. One of them is something that we can guarantee, and one of them is something that it's really left up to the application programmer because it's just too... Uh, this, we don't, the system just doesn't under the semantics of the correctness, so we can't really do anything. So, again, so the, the first example I said about like the, the modeling the class, this is what it's called database consistency. Um, so it just means that the database is going to accurately reflect whatever the thing it's trying to model in the real world, and it doesn't violate any integrity constraints. Like a student can't be enrolled in the same class twice in the same semester. Right, and so we, 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 the data system couldn't, couldn't enforce that if you try to do something. Um, and then any transactions that, that makes a change to this database, uh, any f it, it, when a transaction makes a change to the database, any future transactions will see those, those, those changes, assuming they weren't overwritten, right? Uh, but the, the things will, 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 will persist, right? So again, for a single node database, maybe this doesn't make sense. Like, oh, yeah, of course, I, if I insert a record, I should be able to see it, right? Um, this will make more sense when we talk about distributed databases, where if I insert a record onto, say, a database is stored across multiple machines, and I insert a record on this node over here, uh, if, I'm, my, if I'm told my transaction commits, then I should be able to immediately see that change on, the, on another node. Right? For a single node, again, it's, 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 sort, of, it's sort of weird. Um, but again, distributed databases, if they have strong consistency, they will provide that guarantee. And we'll cover that, how we do that. Uh, I think after Thanksgiving. Uh, transaction consistency, this is the one that's real fuzzy. Uh, it basically means that if the database is consistent before the transaction runs, uh, and if the transaction does consistent things to it or, or is, is consistent, then the end state of the database after the change will be consistent. Right? So it's subjective because, like, the, 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 the database that doesn't understand the semantics of the high level meaning of the changes that the transaction is making, again, like, like well, student can't be enrolled in, in uh, can't be enrolled in the same class twice. Like, you can put, you can put integrity traits for that, but like, a student shouldn't be enrolled in the class if it appears on a Tuesday because of, you know, they have some allergy or something like that, right? That's a high level thing that you wouldn't model in a database that only the application or human actually could know. And therefore, if a transaction violates that, then the database is technically inconsistent, but we just don't know that. Yes? So like an example, like if when you give the bank transfer example, if you assume that money is not created, um, like you have $100, someone else has $100, and like that comes in the transaction. This question is, in my example of, uh, my, of transferring the $100 out of my account, the notion that 
the when a transaction commits, that hundred dollars has to be somewhere. That would be database consistency. Because there's integrity constraints we can put in place to make sure. Well, actually, no, I take that back. It'd be it'd be database consistency because uh, we we don't. These are all tied together because you don't want to allow for the partial updates. So if the transaction commits, it has to be somewhere. Again, I, I, let's not get hung up, hung up too much on consistency here. Again, for distributed databases, it'll make more sense. Um, but again, in general, integrity for transaction consistency, the data system just doesn't, doesn't control it. We can't enforce it. So it's, again, this is, this is more a theoretical thing, not something that any system would actually do. All right, so let's, we're gonna spend most of our time talking about isolation levels or uh, isolation. So the, the thing that we want to achieve is that when an application or user submits a transaction, we want that transaction to execute under the illusion or the, or the, the, the idea that it's running by ourself, running by itself. There's no other transaction running at the same time, and therefore we won't see any updates uh, from other transactions, and we don't worry about them sort of clobbing our, 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 our updates. Right? The reason why we want this is because it's a way easier programming model to, to have, because now in your, in your application code, you don't worry about, you know, should I be seeing things in my database that I, I shouldn't be seeing? Like if I, if I write data, I should, be able to, you know, I should be able to read my own writes. This sort of seems kind of obvious, but the, the whole NoSQL movement was all about not doing this. And you had to write a bunch of extra code to deal with eventual consistency or deal with uh, the lack of isolation of transactions uh, in your application code, because maybe I could write something and not get back my own write. I may actually get back a series of writes. I got to figure out which one I actually want to look at, or series a series of values, right? So the the challenge is going to be that we want to achieve this. We want to have transactions think they're running by themselves, but as we said, we want to interleave them, uh, the reads and writes or transactions that are running at the same time, because that's going to give us better concurrency or better parallelism, right? So we want to be able to interleave our transactions in a way that they appear or they make changes to the database as if they were one at a time running it in serial order, but at the end, uh, but we were actually able to inter interleave them, and we still wanted to be you know the d database has to be correct. So this is what the concurrent control protocol concurrent control scheme is going to provide for us. Now you can think of it as like it's, it's a traffic cop that's going to be responsible for deciding at runtime uh, what operations from what transactions can do what things on uh, what di what uh, different database objects. And it can sometimes deny the request, or it can allow it, and then later on say you shouldn't have done that, and go ahead and abort you, right? So there's two categories of these protocols. He actually so he asked about this earlier, like why can a transaction go to commit, uh, and that is isn't later decides to abort it? Right? That's an example of optimistic concurrent control, because you're going to assume the conflicts are going to be rare, so you let anybody do whatever they want, and only when they go to commit, you look at the things that they actually did. And say, okay, yeah, that's okay. You can commit, or no, that wasn't okay. Uh, you have to abort. Pessimistic occurrence control would be: I assume the problems are going to. I'm assuming I have a lot of problems, so I'm going to require you to, to require transactions to, to, to acquire locks on objects that they want to touch before they do anything. And that way, I know that if you have a lock on something, you're allowed to do whatever it is you want to do on it. So. In some cases, optimistically better. Uh, in other cases, pessimistically better. At the end of the day, if you have you know, the worst contention possible, like you have a million transactions all trying to update a single tuple, they, these things basically are the same thing. It doesn't make a difference. All right, so we, we probably want to mostly think about how to do this on the average case. And none of this comes to free. Just because it's optimistic doesn't mean like it's magically faster than pessimistic. But at the end of the day, there's always book, bookkeeping. There's no free lunch in databases. All right, so let's look at an example here. We have two transactions now, uh, and we have two accounts, A and B, and they both have $1,000. So what we want to do here is we want to take a, we have the first transaction wants to take $100 out of A's account, and put $100 back into B's account. And then there's another transaction that wants to compute interest on the bank accounts and give, give them, you know, everyone gets 6%, right? So, what are the two possible outcomes of running T1 and T2? Assume these things are committed or submitted to the data system at the exact same time by two different threads or two different uh, uh, clients, right? What are the possible outcomes? Well, in this case here, it's, it's, it, well, 
There's many different ways to interleave these things, but at the end of the day, we need a guarantee that if we add A and B after executing T1 and transaction T2, that the total amount that's in the bank for both accounts is 2120. So the data system is not going to guarantee that just because T1 gets submitted for T2 or T2 gets submitted for T1, it's not going to guarantee that it's going to execute those things in exactly that order. And this is going to be slightly weird when you think about maybe other parallel programming you've done where there's memory barriers or x86 is very, very uh, cautious to make sure you get things executed in the right order. In our world in databases, we can actually interchange these or interleave these any way we want. Um, but at the end of the day, we just need to guarantee that whatever the state of the database that we end up with for, for our interleaving is equivalent to executing the transactions in serial order. So either T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1. All right, so the possible outcomes we have for this, uh, uh, if we execute uh, T1 first followed by T2, we would have 954 and 166. Or if we execute T2 followed by T1, we would have 960 or 1160. But at the end of the day, when we add them up, it's always 2120. So let's see what this looks like visually. All right, so here's our, uh, here's, here's the two serial orderings for these two transactions. So I execute T1 first, followed by T2, or execute T2 first, followed by T1. But all that matters is, again, is the, the values of A and B when you add them together equals 2120. Both are correct, even though A has less money in one, uh, B has more money than the other. But from the data system perspective, these are both valid. These are both uh, correct, uh, correct orderings. All right, so we talked about before why we want to interleave our transactions, why we want to do this, because we want to avoid the you know, blocking or stalling because of slow disk and network. Uh, that was the big deal that they cared about in the 1970s, right? Because disk was super slow. Uh, you had limited memory. And so you, you have oftentimes transactions that have to go stall because they had to go fetch things from disk. So even though you only had one core in your CPU, you could then pick up another transaction and run that while the other transaction was waiting for its disk. In modern systems, the disk has gotten faster, memory's gotten larger, but, uh, and for OLTP systems, you want to kind of keep all, most, if not all, the database entirely in memory in your buffer pool. But now you have these multiple CPU cores, uh, and you want to take advantage of those, so this is why you want to start interleaving transactions as well, right? So maybe one transaction stalls because it's waiting on a latch or a lock, and then you let a transact another transaction and another core keep running. Well, we want to make sure that, that we give the appearance as if the, that they were executed in serial order. All right, so let's look at a good, good interleaving uh, for these two transactions. So in this case here, we're going to execute T1 first. It takes $100 out of A, but then there's a context switch for whatever reason. Maybe it stalls in disk, maybe the OS swaps it out, whatever. It doesn't matter. But then T2 starts running. It then does the uh, computes interest on A. Then there's a context switch back to T1. We with the $100 back in B, context switch back in to T2, and it computes the interest on, uh, on B. Right? This is equivalent to executing T1 followed by T2. Right? And the basic idea here is that the, we're always guaranteeing that we compute the interest, uh, do the, yeah, either the deduction or addition on the account in, in T1 before we compute interest in T2. Right? Or likewise, we, we, we could, uh, well, if we, if we do something like this, right, the, the outcome is not equivalent to two possible serial orderings. And we end up missing six dollars in our in our total, which is bad, right? And then, so now the database system doesn't see again these operations like b equals b plus one hundred. So it can't do any like tricks like oh these are commutative. Let me, let me play some game like that, right? All it sees is these read and write operations. So it, again, it doesn't understand the high level meaning of what the what the if I read a record, what's it actually going to do with it when it writes it back? It, we don't know that because that's all over an application code. We only see these little, little things, and we have to deal with, uh, deal with this. So we need a way to actually program, or we need a programmatic way to understand and reason about whether a interleaving in a schedule is actually going to be correct. Like visually, I'm just sort of you know, pointing at stuff and like drawing circles. We can kind of see how this, this, this would be uh, problematic. 
but this is for two transactions and a pretty simple schedule. I need to be able to reason about this at a, at a, a larger scale and obviously do this in a way that's, uh, uh, you know, get, that a program can run, our database systems can actually run. Yes? If you actually run this in Postgres, will it ever give you this bad result? Or you just have this index? The statement is, the question is, if I actually run this in Postgres, or really any database system, uh, could I end up with this, this result? Uh, yes, yeah, so if they're not doing, if they're not running, if the cursor protocol could potentially allow this if you turn off locks and other things, you could, yes. So, would, so like basically, would the transactions, would transactions do this isolation checking for you or not? When you say transact, like would the data system do this for you? I guess you're saying if you turn things off, it doesn't do it, but if you leave them on, it would do it? Yeah, but I'm telling you how to turn it on. I'm telling you how to implement the thing when you turn it on. That's what this is. Okay. Yeah. Like the application code isn't going to have, you don't want people writing their own application code, doing the checks and say, oh, did this happen for this? Because like, there's no guarantee that like, you're gonna, always going to submit these two transactions at the exact same time. What we're trying to discover, discuss today is how do we understand what does it mean to interleave things and end up with the correct state? Next class, so this will be like when I give you the schedule and I give you a fixed set of, of database objects, next class will be if I'm getting incremental uh, queries or incremental read-write operations, how do I guarantee that I end up with a, with a schedule that is, that is correct? All right, so what we're going to find is that we're going to say that a schedule uh, is, that a schedule will be correct if it's equivalent to some serial execution. So we've already said it's sort of what a zero schedule was. It's, it's, there's no interleaving. We're executing the transactions one after another. Um, and we're going to say a uh, schedule is equivalent if the, for any given database state as the input, uh, the effect of executing the, the two transactions for, on a, in a schedule end up producing uh, a new database state that's equivalent to the, to the other schedule. And, and again, these are low-level read and write operations. We don't actually care what the... You know, maybe what, what the, you know, is it, is it addition, multiplication, whatever it is on the, in these objects, it doesn't matter. It just, we want to have the state of the objects be, be the same. And so the, the gold standard what we want to achieve is what is called a serializable schedule. And this just means that the schedule with its interleaving will be equivalent to a sum zero execution of the transactions, right? And so Obviously, this means now if the, the, now the, if the database is consistent, the transaction is consistent, then the, the serializable schedule that we, we would choose or, or, or use would guarantee and preserve that consistency. So again, as I said before, this is, this is kind of a weird concept where I could have transactions get submitted in, in one order, but I'll commit them and, and make, apply their changes in a different order inside of my database system. And that's, that's okay. I mean, and we want that in our database system because uh, it'll guarantee that it gives us more opportunity to come up with different interleavings to maximize the, the amount of parallelism we could have. If you cared about the ordering of, of ex the commit order of transactions uh, based on the, their arrival time, then you either do that in the application with your own barrier that says, okay, I submit T1, wait till it comes back, then I submit T2. Or there are some systems, which is, they're rare, uh, there are some systems that will guarantee you that the, the commit order will be the same as the, the rival order. That's called uh, strong serializability or external consistency. There's not many systems that do this. Google, Spanner, and Fauna are probably the two the main ones. Question, yes? So, um, I just wanted to ask, like, at a high level, why are we calling this isolation? Like, even in, like, this slide, we call it, like, if the transaction is like, consistent, we say, why are we calling it isolation to be broken and not uh, his question is, why are we saying this is, uh, why, we, why make a big deal about this is isolation, not consistency? Uh, because, because, again, it's the, if you ignore maybe this, this sentence here, it, it, we want the state of the database to be as if we're executing them in isolation of others. And that means that not only do we, do we end up with the serializable, serial, uh, you know, the serial ordering or, or, or serial equivalent to a serializable ordering or schedule, that as part of that, we're not going to be able to see any effects of any transactions that are running at the same time as well. So I'll guarantee the state of the database at the end is equivalent to a serial ordering. And while I'm, as part of that, while I'm running, I won't see the effects of anybody else running at the same time as me. 
because this is, consistency basically means that like as part of that like i i the data so if it was, it was correct when it started it's correct when it's afterwards uh even though i interleave things but again as i said you could have temporary inconsistencies but that's okay at the end as long as everything's consistent that's correct okay so as i said most systems don't uh don't get guarantee that arrival order execution that again Sp spanner does this I they claim their paper for ad, for you know for Google Ads, it's a big deal, and that's why they need it. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't I don't know if that's actually true, but as they said, uh, most systems don't don't do that. Most systems, if they actually most systems may not even give you serializable uh, execution that we're describing here. Uh, it's it's not on by default in most systems. Uh, if you get it, if you ask for a serialized one in uh, in in Oracle, they'll lie to you and actually give you something weaker. Um, in general, like uh, this is the gold standard because this is the this is guaranteed not to have any anomalies, any problems in your application code or in, in your transactions. All right, so now we got to define what does it mean to have. Um, I need a programmatic way to say, okay, can we have this transact or is this is this schedule actually uh, serializable? So what we're going to do is we're going to identify the conflicting operations in two schedules or sorry, two, two, uh, in, in one or more transactions, or two or more transactions. And we're going to say that the operations are going to conflict if they occur in different transactions and they're accessing the same object and at least one of the transactions is doing a write on them. Right? You could have a read-write, write-write, or a write-read. And then we can look at these conflicts and identify what are some of the anomalies that could occur that should not occur, would not have occurred if it was actually a serial ordering. And if we can identify these anomalies, then we would know that this is not a, a serializable ordering, or sorry, a serializable schedule. So I have the three sort of three basic anomalies: read, read, write, write, read, and write, write conflicts. There's no read, read conflict because obviously, who cares if I, you and I read the same thing? That that's not a conflict. Um, there are two additional anomalies that we'll cover next week: uh, phantom reads and write skew. But for our purposes here, we, we can focus on the the three main ones. All right, so the first one is a write-read conflict, also known as unrepeatable read. And this means that a transaction tries to read an object multiple times in, in, while it's running, and it gets back a different value uh, at some later, later point. All right, so T1 starts, it reads A, it gets $10. Then there's a context switch, T2 starts running, it reads $10 as well, but then it writes back $19. And then now when this transaction uh, reads, reads A again, now it sees 19 and it shouldn't, right? If it was truly running in isolation of any other transaction, it would see $10 again, right? So this is, this is called an unrepeatable read. Uh, again, this would violate a serial ordering. A write read conflict, also known as a dirty read, is where one transaction reads data from another transaction that hasn't committed yet, and then say that other transaction then is, uh, does some action based on that, that, that dirty data, that it, sh it shouldn't have seen. So we read $10 here, right back $12. Then is the context which T2 starts running. It reads the $12 that, that T1 wrote. And then there's some additional logic or something where it says, okay, well, let me add $2 to it. Now it's $14. It goes and commits. And assume at this point here, we tell the outside world, yes, your transaction has committed. Go, your T2 is done, you're good. But then T1 aborts. And now we gotta roll back the change that it made in A, but we've already leaked to the outside world uh, the write that, that T1 made, and that shouldn't have happened if it was running in serial order. Right? So this is bad. We, we don't want this to happen. The last one is a write-write conflict, also known as a lost update. And this is where we have a transaction that's allowed to overwrite uncommitted data from another transaction, uh, and you could potentially end up with, with torn writes. So T1 starts, does a write on A. T2 starts, overwrites on A. Then writes on B, uh, and as in DJ Mushu, and then T, T1 runs again, and now writes Andy. So in this case here, you would have the value of A would have been written by T2, but the value of B would have been written by T1, which shouldn't happen if there was, if there was a serial ordering, right? Because uh, it'd either be all the changes for T1 or all the changes in T2. Yes? Can you go back to the uh, power key from T2? Yes. Yes. But does the write conflict with the first read in T1 or the second read? 
the question is, is the conflict, uh, is the conflict with the first read or the second read? Yeah. It's the second read, right? I mean, it's the combination of the two of them, right? If I, if I see $10 here, then I, I, then anytime I read on A again, I should see $10. Statement is if T1 only does one read, there's no problems. Yes. Assuming that, uh, if, say, I read on, read on A here uh, and I don't do anything else and I commit, there's not a conflict. Yeah. Yes. On this uh, J read, yes. uh, assuming it is not abort, so you can still commit, is it still correct or not? So instead of abort, I do commit here. Is that still okay? That would be okay in this example here. Uh, why? Well, <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah, so, so, like, if this guy commits, then since it didn't update anything else, technically, like, the, the state of the database is correct because, uh, because, like, this guy overwrote anything this guy wrote anyway. So it would be T1 followed by T2. That would still be correct. So a statement is, uh, say this is like getting queued up, and then you commit, and then you over, then you overwrite it. In this case here, it would overwrite that. Uh, well, this is we'll get this in a second. This, this would be equivalent to view sterilizable, uh, where at the end of the day, the state of the database for A is correct because like it, it is whatever the last one that committed is. Uh, <laughs> But like, if it was truly running in 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 isolation, like like in serial mode, this guy should not be able to see that update anyway. So that that's the violation that we want to prevent. There's a high level. Okay, this is, sounds kind of fuzzy. There's a high level uh, concept of like doesn't matter. That's very hard for us to, to enforce. So we can't. So we'll, we'll be we'll be very pessimistic. I don't use that word. Very strict and say this. I can't. Don't use that word either. That means something else. Uh, we want to be, uh, we want to enforce that like you can't see right from other people. So, so if T1 commits in between ports, the value of A? If, T1, if T1 commits instead of aborting, what would the value of A be? Um, it depends on the implementation of the currency control. If it's, because uh, you could like, <sighs> yeah, sorry, let me think about this. It depends on the implementation. Because it could be the case that like, this thing runs in like temporary mode, not temporary mode, this is running like its own private workspace and then when it goes to commit, then it applies the changes. And so if this guy's already committed, then he's overwriting that, even though in, in wall clock time, he wrote first, but he wrote in a private workspace that nobody ever saw. So, this is why I love transactions, because it's like this concept of like, there's like the wall clock time and then and there's like this transactional time thing and you, you can do whatever you want in them. So if the final value is 12, it's not correct, right? But the, in this case here, the final value is 12. It is not correct. Uh, or in this case, yes, because uh, this should have rolled back. But again, think of like, think of why you don't want to allow this because say I read A, and then I don't know what to actually do with that A, right? Maybe there's an if-then-else statement. So like if value is, is not equal to 12, then don't write $14. But if it is right, equal to 12, then write $14. So if this guy got aborted, this guy should not have been able to read, read A, sorry, read $12, and therefore it shouldn't have done that right. That's why you don't want to allow this. In the back, yes. The question is, so in this case here, we have the right, right conflict on right B and right B here. T2 is already committed. Why, why is this then a problem? Yeah. Because... So again, it has to be equivalent to a serial ordering. So it's either going to be all the values of T1 or all the values from T2. In this case here, assuming that like on commit that I applied the changes, I would see the... Uh, I would see the right on A, I'm sorry, I would see the right on A from this guy, but on the right on B from this guy. And that would not have happened if I executed them in serial ordering.
Yes. Um, so is there anything to consider in considering a transaction fee if any of the applications is okay with us uh, being in a space where either it's two one round things two round second or opposite so in this case I guess T one T two and then T two T one could use different things. Yes. So the question is, and this is, what, this is the, the thing I was trying to say before. Um, the question is, does the application have to be okay with the idea that I could either be T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1? The answer is yes. Right? And that's, again, if, if you cared about the exact ordering, the T1 followed by T2, then you, you either need to use a database that supports external consistency, which we're not talking about here, or you write in your application your own barrier that says, okay, execute T, T1. When I get commit, then I execute T2. Right. Right. Either in the application code, or you can do some extra stuff on on the server side, but that's hard. And it's more work. Most people don't care. The truth is also too. I would say, like, I want to get through the serializable stuff because it's important to understand. Like, this is the, like, this is the the how do I say this? This is the gold standard of what you would have in a database system. But in actuality, most systems don't actually achieve what we're talking about here. They run at a lower isolation level where you may allow some of these anomalies. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. But, but it, it's hard because nobody knows. This is actually an open research problem. Like nobody knows how bad things actually can get. Because like the application is doing, you know, if you're executing a million transactions a second, if one of these anomalies cause a problem, would you actually know? Probably not. But it's, I think it's important to understand what serializable is. And then we can then strengthen it or weaken it. Okay. Um, so this now gets into the, the, the comment that she, where I thought she was going about like, uh, at the end of the day, does it, you know, in, in that right, right conflict or, or in the, um, in one of the conflicts, did it actually matter that like the, the right from one transaction overrode another? Um, so the, the things we're talking about going forward, these are going to be techniques or method for us to determine whether a schedule is correct, whether it's equivalent to a serial ordering. Um, next class will be how we actually generate a, a serial ordering or serializable schedule at runtime, right? So this is like, again, from a pencil and paper point of view, we have all the transactions, we have the transactions ahead of time, we know the, the operations they want to execute. In a real system, you usually don't have that. There's only one system, Fauna, that actually looks at all the transactions ahead of time and then does the scheduling things. Most systems, it's where the application is incrementally sending queries, gets back a result, does some additional logic, and, it's, and then writes, sends more queries. So you got to, the, the protocols we'll talk about next week are how to do this on the fly as, as new, new queries are coming in. Today's class is just, just about how do I look at a schedule and the operations of the transactions I want to do, I know everything ahead of time, and figure out whether it's serializable or not. So there's going to be two different levels of serializability we care about. There's actually more, but that's, that's in the theory world. We don't care about that. There's conflict serializability and view serializability. Most systems, actually all systems, when you say, I want serializable, assuming it actually implements it correctly, Oracle doesn't, uh, then you will get this. View serializability is, this, uh, is, is sort of impossible or very difficult to actually achieve because it requires semantic understanding of what the application actually wants to do with the data. Uh, and that requires you to like parsing the, 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 potentially parsing the application code, which is not easy to do, uh, or understand like high level concepts that humans would care about. So that's why no system would actually can do this. All right, so what we're gonna do now is gonna say that a two schedules of conflict equivalent, if they involve the same transactions, the same operations, and all the pairs of, of conflicting actions will be ordered in some way. And then if we, we can achieve this, uh, we can achieve, uh, we can determine whether a schedule is conflict serializable if we can guarantee that it's conflict equivalent to some serial schedule. Everyone's eyes are glazing over. This probably doesn't make any sense, right? The basic idea of how we're going to achieve this is that we're going to do the swapping technique where we can move conflicting operations, uh, sort of swap their order in the schedule so that we sort of push all the, the operations from one transaction to the top all the operations to another transaction at the bottom, and we end up with a, a serial ordering. And if we guarantee, if we achieve that, then we know we have something that's conflict serializable. 
All right, so say we have two transactions. T1 was a, they both want to read on A, write on A, then read on B, and write on B. So what we want to do is we want to find uh, conflicting, um, conflicting operations, or sorry, non-conflicting operations where we can swap their order and try to push all the T1's operations at the top, push all T2's operations at the bottom. So in this case here, this wants to do a read on B, and that wants to do a, a write on A. Uh, they're not conflicting, so we can swap their order. Now we have a write on B, uh, sorry, a read on A, read, read on B, read on A. They're not conflicting because they're both reads. Swap their order. Same thing with this write on B. That's a write on A. We can swap that. Write on B, read on A, swap that. Yes? Isn't this just killing all our concurrency then? Again, we're not doing this at runtime. We're just, this is just theory, pencil and paper, proving that we, that, that we can determine whether this is actually conflict serialized or not. A real system wouldn't actually do this. So, you, so your question is like, would this kill a, a parallelism? We're not. I'm not saying that I would. I'm not saying I would execute it in this order because then it's just zero ordering. I'm trying to say if I start here with my original schedule, this thing here is this conflict serializable? Yes or no? And by swapping, by pushing things up and down, you you can determine that it is equivalent to a zero ordering. To move the commit, yeah. I'm. I'm sorry. I, uh, was, I think what I was just trying to do is say, like, by the time this commits, uh, I can ignore everything below that. Yes. So then, with the converse, when we try to maximize um, concurrency, do we just start with it fully like this, and then try to take everything from T two and push it as far up as we can? The statement is, if I if I start with a serial ordering, the, the way to find the, the most parallel schedule. Would I then try to do the reverse of this? Yes, but in real system, you, you wouldn't do this because you wouldn't know. Like you would see, like the, the application would call begin, and maybe you see the first read, but you wouldn't know what comes after that. Oh. And by the time you get to the bottom here, you've already executed the other ones. Two phase locking will, will fix this for us on, on Tuesday next week. That's the interactive transaction, right? Some databases don't support interactive transaction. You have to spend the entire transaction from begin to end to the database. So the statement is, uh, some systems require you to send all the transactions from beginning to end to the database ahead of time. Yeah, so DynamoDB does that, Fauna does that. Uh, they, yeah, so, so in that case, you, you, yeah, they're basically, they wouldn't use this algorithm because this is obviously inefficient, but like you would figure out the interleaving within a batch and then submit them all at once. Most systems don't do that. Most applications aren't written that way. Yes. What if instead T1 is committing at the end to the port? Do you still consider uh, this equivalent to a serializable? So, so, his, so his question is, instead of T, T1 committing it aborts, would this still be considered uh, serializable? Going back here. Um, let, we, can, I, we can ignore aborts for this. Uh, it depends on how it's implemented, right? Like. This is just getting this is just pencil and paper. Yes. Are we assuming here that uh, whenever like A is written like in T one, T needs to be available to T two. Again, that that's the, that's the implementation detail. We can we can ignore that for now. All right. So this is equivalent to this. Uh, here's one that isn't right. If we try to swap the right on A, the right on A uh, here, uh, we cannot swap with this, right? Because uh, they're both rights, so therefore this is not equivalent to a, a serial order, right? So this swapping thing, it'll work. It's easy to do for two transactions, but it's common to do when there's many transactions. Uh, and so a faster way, approach to do this is to use what is called a dependency graph. Uh, I think Wikipedia might call this a dependency, uh, sorry, precedence graph. Um, the basic idea in our graph is that we're going to have one node uh, per transaction that, that's in our schedule. And then we'll have an edge from, from, from transaction T1 to transaction TJ. If there's an operation in the first transaction that conflicts with another operation uh, in the other transaction, and that first operation in the first transaction appears earlier in the schedule than the operation in the other transaction. So you would have a directed edge from TI to TJ. And so we would look at the entire schedule, build out this, this dependency graph, and if there's no cycle, in, in the graph, then we know that the, uh, that the, the schedule is conflict serializable. 
All right, so we go back to our example here. So write on A, read on A, write on A, and read on B and write on B. In this case here, we have a conflict between write A and read A. So we have an edge from T, T1 to T2. Then if here we'd have a conflict on write B to, to read B. Uh, so we'd have an edge from T2 back to T1. We have a cycle, therefore this is, uh, this, this is not conflict serializable, right? Let's look at a more complicated example here. Now we have three transactions. So we're going to do a read on A uh, in T1, and that'll conflict with the write on A in T3. So we have an edge from T1 to T3. Uh, we have another write on A to a read on A in T3, but since we already have an edge from T1 to T3 in our dependency graph, we don't need to draw it again. Same thing with the write-write conflict here. So we don't, we don't need to draw that again. Uh, and then on this side here, the only conflict we would have is the write on B to read on B. So we'd have an edge from T2 to T1. And then write on B and write, to, write B in T2 and write to B on T, T1. Again, we already have an edge there, so it is uh, is uh, we don't we don't draw additional edge. Right. So, is this equivalent to a serial execution? Well, by definition, yes, because since there's no cycle in the graph, it is, uh, and it would be T2 followed by T1 followed by T3. Right. And again, this this idea that we can reorder the the commit. Uh, the commit ordering of transactions to be different than their arrival order. In this case here, T3 called begin before T1, uh, assuming this is, this is wall clock time. Uh, but in our serial order, we're going to say that T3 uh, will get committed after T2, even though it started before. And that's still okay. That's still equivalent to a serial ordering. Yes? The, the state of the database will be equivalent to where T3 ex committed after T, T2. And that's okay. All right, so, so in the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, view serializability. Again, no application actually, no database actually support this. I just quickly, I'll show you the basic idea here is that like, if I, if I try to compute something like I add to, I want to read B, read A, read B, and then add them together and print it out. Uh, if I do my dependency graph stuff, then I will have cycles, and this will say that this is, uh, you know, this is not conflict serializable. But if I just change the code where I don't actually care about the sum, uh, the exact value, all I want to know is the number of accounts that have, have, a, uh, that have more than $0 in, in, their, in their bank account. So if I just rewrite the application to this, then, uh, assuming that you know these values are above zero, then I can produce this the, actually the correct result. But again, this is hard. How would the application know that this is actually what you're trying to do, and that this count doesn't really matter? I mean, you can do maybe deeper uh, deeper static analysis to understand what's going on, but now you got to support every possible lang query, uh, programming language that someone writes an application in, right? And that'd be super hard. So this is what view serializable means. Right. Or the other example that uh, I think someone brought up before, like if I do a blind write, like if I T2 writes A and T3 writes A without actually ever reading it, then even though there's a cycle in my dependency graph, at the end of the day, all I care about is that this guy wrote it last. And that's okay. Right? So the main thing I'm just pointing out is like there's, there's a there's a looser notion of serializability that you can get through view serializability, but it requires you to understand, you know, are certain things okay in the application? Or is the program actually going to care? And that, that's really hard to do, so nobody does it. Okay. Um, right, so pretty much if you have to serializability, this is what you get. So the way to think about what possible schedules could exist is through this, sort of this, this nested structure here. So say that this, this region here is all possible schedules. No notion of correctness, no notion of serial ordering or serializable. It's anything you possibly could do, right? And then in the middle is going to be serial ordering. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, and then after that would be conflict serializable. And then after that would be view, view serializable. So any schedule that is serial is also conflict serializable and view serializable, but not every view serializable schedule or conflict serializable schedule is, is serial. Right, so most systems again are going to be hanging out in this middle part here because it's 
it's efficient to execute it, or you can efficiently implement it, you can efficiently guarantee that this property, uh, and there's enough opportunities for parallelism uh, that you, you, can, you can get better performance than you would in otherwise in serial ordering. All right, so quickly, I won't say much about transaction durability. We've already talked about a bunch of things, the logging and the, uh, and the, the shadow paging. We'll go into more details how this all works uh, in, in two weeks. I realize I keep saying we'll talk about this in the future, but there's a lot to cover here, and it's, I can't, can't sort of... You guys ask your questions about, hey, what about this? And there's, there's answers to those things. They're in the future lectures. Uh, so I, I, I just want to say we will cover this uh, in the future. All right, and then we've, we've discussed all the asset stuff before. So the, in my opinion, the concurrent control and the recovery mechanisms in a data system are, are some of the most important features, along with the query optimizer. This is really hard to do to, and get correct and make sure you don't lose data, don't have transactions do things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, you want transactions. It makes it easier for the programmer to, to write code and not worry about uh, weird issues. There's always some, I think it was a Bitcoin uh, exchange that went, went down recently because... They, or they, they, some guy bled them all the money because they, they weren't doing transactions correctly. Uh, so you, you, you want a data system that does transactions. You don't have to worry about these anomalies because the data, data system will guarantee, uh, guarantee it for you. And so we'll see next class how we're going to use concurrency control to automatically guarantee that we can take any arbitrary set of queries that are showing up from our application and still guarantee that we achieve serializability. And then we'll talk about weaker isolation levels where we can start relaxing some of these guarantees and allow some anomalies to occur because that's going to potentially give us better performance. And so don't take my opinion that I think transactions are super important. There's this paper from Google about Spanner uh, over 10 years ago in OCI. Right? Google was at sort of the forefront or they were sort of the vanguard of the NoSQL movement because they built all these systems that didn't do transactions because they cared about performance and scalability. Uh, and everybody copied them because you know Google was making a lot of money. They're smart. Let's let's do what they did. And then Google realized, oh, for transactions, is actually a good idea. So there's this line in the paper that says we believe it is better to have application programmers deal with performance problems due to overuse transactions as bottlenecks arise, rather than coding around the lack of transactions. Because the lack of transactions is the comment I said before in these NoSQL systems where you have to write your own application code to deal with all the those anomalies that I talked about. So if you don't, you know, the average programmer is probably not going to be able to reason about these things. Let the data system finish it, do it for you. Okay. I want to quickly talk about Project 3. Um, so Project 3 is out. You're going to be implementing uh, query execution support in BusTub. BusTub now supports basic SQL. Uh, and we have a rule-based optimizer that can take a SQL query, convert it to an AST, and then uh, convert that AST into a, to a, to a physical plan. And then you, the, your job is to build the query executors or the operator executors that can execute the, those query plan nodes, right? So everything is posted on um, on the project website, and the uh, and you pull the latest version from from GitHub. So there's two sort of two major tasks. Most of the work we spent on doing plan node executors. So you do a sequential scan, index scan. The we're only doing inserts and deletes. You don't have to worry about updates. Um, and then you do a basic nested loop join and an index nested loop join, then aggregations, uh, limits, and sorts. So for those that struggled on project two, checkpoint two, when having a current uh, uh, index, if you think your thing has bugs, just put a latch on top of the entire data structure, and that'll be okay for, for project three. Okay? <laughs> what? Would it be efficient Well, we'll get, we'll get to that in a second, right? Um, and then we have a, a rule-based optimizer. There'll be one task at the end where you have to convert the order by and limit clause into a top end, right? Which is, which is more efficient. So now the question is, will that be efficient? No. But for the leaderboard, what we're going to do, rather than relying on you having, um, you know, just sort of having whoever had the fastest project one and project two crush it also for project three on the leaderboard, we've actually given additional tasks now that. Uh, would not necessarily rely on you having the fastest implementation for, the, for your buffer pool manager and your, and your index, right? The basic idea is that you have to implement new optimizer rules to get uh, better query plans. Because the, the, for certain queries, the optimizer we have now will produce horribly inefficient query plans. And no matter how fast your B plus 3 is, you, you would lose out. 
So this is the idea here to, to make it so that like it's not the same people always getting top ranking uh, for the subsequent projects. You can actually do some extra stuff and, and, and still beat them. So the task you have to do for this is implement optimized rules to do joint reordering, column pruning, and then a more aggressive predicate pushdown. Yes? If I don't do this, will that interfere with project four? Uh, his question is, if I don't do this, will that interfere with project four? No. Okay, cool. Yes, this is optional. Yes. All right, so my advice to you guys, start with insert, special scan, do that first. You can, so you can implement, you can you know, actually read data. Um, there are, uh, there is a mock table that he has, a mock sequential scan. Uh, but Chi did this. This is, he's fantastic. Um, so there, there are, uh, there are, um, how do I say this? There are internal tables that you can then run queries on and maybe test other parts of your database, like, like the, your sort clause and so forth. But I recommend you start with insert and sequential scan, right? You do not need to worry about transactions just yet. All the things we talked about today, don't worry about that. Uh, the, the aggregation and sorting do not need to be backed by the buffer pool. You don't need to external merge sort. You don't need to have your hash table to spill a disk. Assume that everything fits in memory and then you use the standard template library functions for these things. And again, of course, grade scope is not meant for grading, uh, or sorry, not meant for debugging. Uh, write your own local tests, all right? So you do not change on the files that you did, uh, the ones you submitted on, on grade scope. Make sure you pull the latest change from us. Of course, post on Piazza and come to office hours. But the one thing we have this time for you guys, which is super, super exciting, is there is now a, uh, there's now a, um, a browser version of BusTub. You use mscript to convert the, the C++ code into JavaScript. Uh, and so you can run queries. I'm going to forget it. Like this, project three already done on it? this is project three is already done on it. Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, so whatever. But you can create tables. Did I? No. Did she? Yes. Insert into. Uh, the question is why is it called bus tub? Yes. Um, all right, so you get a row. Select star from foo, and you get it back. But he also supports explain. So you, you can see the query plan, right? So this is fully implemented for the project. As far as I know, I think the optimizer rules are implemented. So you, you can throw the query in and see, see, what, see what you get back out of this, OK? So you can check to see whether your, your implementation matches this. So the database is running on your browser? It runs in your browser. It runs in tiny JavaScript. OK. Don't cheat. Or you're you're going to shift away, OK? <laughs> Next class, two-phase locking, isolation levels, OK? <laughs> See you guys. They ain't cold, it's taking this toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a dub. Show some love, three for 50, is you with me what I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Found a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snakes.